exam three is a week from today. So that's Thursday. Um, 328. And uh, I'm not going to put any structures on this. So um, which which problem set remind me which problem set is comes first rigid body statics or centroids in the way I have them set up. And then centroids is next. Okay, so the topics, we're not going to do any structures. The topics are just going to be everything up through centroids. Okay. We should have plenty of time to get comfortable with this stuff. And remember, these tests are cumulative, so you need to be ready for old material too. Um, equations and stuff. Yes, the formulas for the individual shapes and stuff like that. Uh, the sum formulas for centroids. I'll give you all that stuff. Um, the only the only time I would ever so if you ever take a test and you'd like an equation that isn't on there, ask me and I'll write it up on the board for you. The only exception to that is if I've said, you know, explicitly before that I'm going to want you to derive, be able to derive an equation. That'll happen later on in the semester once or twice, but most of the time, whatever equation you want, I'll give it to you if I haven't already. Um, any other questions about the test? Okay. Um, so last time I went through, anyone have any homework questions? Okay. Um, on Tuesday, if you have homework questions related to the exam or whatever, feel free to bring them and I'll answer those um, as long as you want. If it takes the whole time, we can do that. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to keep sort of plugging ahead with new material that's not on the test. So last time uh, we started structures yes oh okay well then i can't do that so uh you'll have to ask me questions i guess i have office hours monday and wednesday and if you ask me questions on email i'll i'll get you answers um by the way, if you ever, you know, it can be sort of hard to ask questions over email to like mathematical things. Um, best way to do it is just snap a picture on your phone or whatever and email me the pic, you know, ask me the question, but then email a picture of your work or whatever, you know, and the, the drawing and stuff. And it's a lot easier to communicate that way. And, and I can do the same thing back than to try to type out, you know, describe what the picture would look like and that kind of thing. Okay, last time we started structures, and we did this very um, complicated, I mean, it was a very simple structure, but we did this full approach where we, um, where we treated all the pins as, uh, we treated all the pins as particles, and we treated all the, the members as rigid bodies, and it looked like this. And a pin joint connected those two. And um, the angles, it was an equilateral triangle, so all the angles were 60. And the lengths of the members were one meter. And there was a force applied at the pin up here of 500 newtons. And we labeled the joints A, B, C. And we labeled the members, member one there and member two there. And again, that numbering is total and 
lettering, all those labels are totally arbitrary. Um, and then, so I first did it by isolating the particles and the rigid bodies, and we got a system of 12 equations for 12 unknowns. Now I'm going to simplify it. Um, I'm going to lump the pins in with members. Uh, and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to put them with the lowest numbered member at each joint. And so I'm going to quickly, this was what I did at the end of class last time. Um, I drew side views of all of these joints so you could see what's touching what. The pin A, we have the ground connected to a bracket. And then pin is part of member one, because at this joint, the lowest numbered member is one. And then at joint B, we have the two members connected. Um, this is member two angling one way, and this is member one angling the other way. And at this joint, The two members are one and two, so the lowest numbered one is one. And that means that the pin is part of member one. And then the force is applied to the pin. In other words, that force is applied to member one, not to member two. And then at C, we kind of have the same thing going on that we did uh, at A. There's member two, and the pin is part of member two. Okay, so using these ideas of where the pin is associated, um, we're just going to isolate the individual members. And this time, we're going to skip isolating the pins. OK, so um, I'm going to start with a free body diagram of member one. At the joint A, what loads are applied to member one? What's touching it? Yeah, well, the pin is member one. So that's, so the ground. Yep, exactly. That's the way I want you to think about it. So the pin is member one. And so all we have here is, I'll call it the reaction from the ground, or I'll call it RA. Okay. And then up at joint B, what's touching member one? Two things. The pin is member one, and so two is touching member one. So you have the force on one by two, and you also have that 500 Newton force. It's applied to the pin, and the pin is member one. So. Any questions about that? And now I'm going to write out the row vector, the force vector, and the moment vector. Um, we have to choose an about point. Uh, I guess I'll choose this one. Might be better to choose the other one, but it's not a big deal. Um, so first, the force RA, what's the row vector going from the about point to where RA is applied? 
I'll give you a hint, it's less than one. Yep. Right, the about point is where the force is applied, so no row vector. The force vector is R A X R A Y. And the cross product of those two is zero. All I'm listing are the Z components of the moments for two dimensional stuff. Uh, the second force is F12. The length of this member is one. It's 60 degrees above horizontal. So, um, so the row vector is going to be cosine and sine of 60 degrees. So that's positive 0 0.5, positive 0 0.866. The force vector is F12X, F12Y. And the cross product is 0.5 F12Y minus 0.866 F12X. And then last is the 500 Newton force. Uh, any forces that are at the same point have the same row vector. So this has to be this one again, 0 0.5, 0 0.866. What's that 500 Newton force as a vector? 500, zero. It's in the positive x direction. And so we have... 0.5 times 0 minus 0 0.866 times 500, so that's negative 433. All right, so the equations from this, Newton's second law says add up all the forces and set it equal to 0. Um, and so we get two equations from this. The first one says RAX plus F12X is equal to negative 500. The second one says RAY plus F12Y is equal to zero. And then the moment equation says uh, 0.5 F12Y minus 0.866 F12X minus 433 is equal to zero. So our third equation says, I'm going to rearrange these. Negative 0.866 F12X plus 0.5 F12Y is equal to 433. All right, so we have our first three equations. We only get three equations for each rigid body in two dimensions. So we're done with that first body. Uh, how many, well, I just said we have three equations. How many variables do we have? Four, yep. And so we can't solve it yet. So now we're going to isolate the other body. So down at the ground, in the lower right, what's in contact with number two? Just the ground. So I'll call that RC. And now 
even for this simple member, uh, simple structure, this is the one kind of tricky thing. What's in contact with member two? Only member one. That's the key thing. That's the whole reason why I drew these side views. Okay. That force is applied to the pin. The pin is member one. And so that force doesn't have anything to do with member two. And intuitively, you say that doesn't make any sense. Changing that force is going to affect member two. That's true, but it's only going to affect it through that contact force between one and two. Okay. And so we don't put it in there. Um, so there's a force on two by one. We've already named a force vector F12, so rewrite this as negative F12. And now rho force moment. Uh, I guess I'll choose the ground point as the about point. So first, the force RC has no row vector. Force vector is RCX, RCY, and the cross product is zero. And then the force negative F12, the row vector is, so this would be cosine and sine of negative 120 degrees. So negative 0.5, positive 0.866. The force vector is negative F12x, negative F12y. And you get 0.5 F12y plus 0.866 F12x. And Newton's second law now add up all the forces. RCX, RCY, plus negative F12x, negative F12y is equal to zeros. Um, so this gives us equation four that says RCX minus F12X is equal to zero. And equation five says RCY minus F12Y is equal to zero. And then the moment equation says, um, well, I can just jump right to equation six. Um, equation six says 0.866 F12X plus 0.5 F12Y is equal to zero. And now we have six equations and how many variables? Six. So now we can solve it. And uh, by, just by lumping the pins in with the members, we reduced the number of equations and variables we had to solve for from 12 to six. So that's worth doing, you know, even though it does, it makes it a little bit trickier to understand, like in a way, it's very easy to understand the idea of isolating the individual pins and isolating the individual members. This, you have to be a little more careful. These side views help, but it just cuts down the number of equations so much without losing any of the power of it that I think this is the way to go. So notice before we solve this, Now there's 
six variables. compared to 12 with the original method. Okay, so let's solve this. Um, so we, we need a matrix with six rows. and seven columns. The rows are the equations, one, two, three, four, five, six. The columns are the variables, R, A, X, R, A, Y, R, C, X, R, C, Y, F, one, two, X, F12Y, and then the constants. Can someone read the coefficients off to me from start with equation one? Excuse me. And there's one, it's ones for both of those. RAX, F12X. Okay. Okay. Equation two. Okay. Okay. And zero. All right. Okay. Negative 0.866 and then zero for the constant. Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay. All right, and zero. And then, okay. And then positive. And zero. All right. Can someone uh, reduce row echelon form that and Okay. Okay. And positive four thirty three. One confirmation. Uh, all right, so let's go one one more step than we have here. Um, go back to the free body diagrams, put in all these forces that we calculated, and interpret this. Okay, so first for member one, we have a force negative 250, negative 433. 
And up at the top, we have negative 250, positive 433. And we also have that 500 Newton force in the positive x direction. So we can think of it like that. And if you calculate any forces that are at the same point, you can add together. You know, so this is, you can think of this as just a single force applied at the top. And we come up with a thing that looks like this with a magnitude of 500 and this with a magnitude of 500. Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, so over here, so there are two forces up here on number one, right? This one that we calculated, and then the 500 Newton force this way, and I represented that as vector components. Since all these two forces both act at the same point, there's no reason to keep them separate, you know, separated. Um, and so you can just add those two vectors together, and that gives you the single force at this point of positive 250, positive 433. And then if you use the inverse tangent, you'd see and calculated the magnitude, you'd see that's a magnitude of 500 exactly in line with that number. And the second member. Uh, over here, we have negative F12, so that's positive 250, negative 433. And then down here, we have negative 250, positive 433. And if you calculate those directions and magnitudes, you get a compressive force of 500 newtons on each end parallel to the member. And that's exactly what we got with the, with the long approach. So this is definitely preferable. Um, and I'm going to say something now that I've said at least once before, and I'm going to say it at least like 30 more times in this class. Um, so this is what I'll call the general method for structures. And it works for every structure. Any structure that's not over, over constrained, you know, and we'll talk about that stuff later. But any structure that you can solve using the ideas of statics, you can use with this approach. Um, so now there is. A faster method for structures called trusses. Um, and I'll talk about that a little later. This simple problem that we did is a truss. So there is a faster way to solve this particular problem, but the faster method doesn't work for every structure. Okay. So to me, this is the starting point. You know, this will work every single time. You never have to try anything new, classify anything. But um, you know, but this faster method only works for a small subset of structures. Okay, so now I'm going to write out 
a set of steps for this general method. Um, And it's basically just following the steps that we took in that example. Um, so first, uh, number each member. The order is totally arbitrary. It's just for bookkeeping. Um, and then at each joint, um, assume the joint itself, almost always that's going to be pins, but it could be other types of joints too. Um, assume the joint itself is part of the lowest numbered member at that joint. Um, drawing those side views helps a lot, especially in really complicated structures. Um, second, for each member, draw a free body diagram. and write out Newton's second law and the rotational Newton's second law. Um, be sure to minimize the number of variables. So for example, um, if you've already used, you know, let's say F23, you've already used a force F23, then instead of introducing a new F32 when that comes up, be sure that you call that negative F23. Okay, if you call it F32, you've introduced a new variable when you don't have to. Newton's third law says you can just use the old one and multiply by negative one. Uh, and then the last step, um, once the number of equations Matches up with the number of variables. Use reduced row echelon form to solve. Um, any questions about that?
OK, I'm going to instead of going through the math of another example, I'm going to draw a more complicated structure and I'm just we're just going to go through the free body diagrams. I think a lot of times that really helps. So. Um, so I'm going to do the free body diagrams only. For a structure. So let's say um, you have a pin joint over here. and a roller here and we'll assume that those are all it's all pin joints i drew it a little too small to fit those in but everything's connected by pins and let's put a force on this um, and i'm going to number these one, two, three, four, five. Why did I apply that thousand Newton force at the center of that? I mean, well, you could say like, I'm just doing something that's say that's an application of something we're building. And so, so I want to represent what really happened. But I want you to notice one thing because this trust simplification that when we get to it is going to make certain problems very easy. If I move this thousand Newton force over to here, the truss simplification approach would solve this a lot faster than the general approach. But I moved it to here, and the truss simplification can't do anything with it. You know? But this general method, it works exactly the same. Okay, so. That's the painful thing about this fast approach. All right, well, um, I guess I'll also label these joints because I'm gonna draw side views of all of these. So let's call this A, B, C, D. So for the joint A, um, so there's the bracket connected to the ground. Uh, there's member two that's horizontal. And member one is diagonal going away. Okay, so this is member one, this is member two, this is the ground, and that pin is part of member one. Okay. So when we isolate member two, at the joint A, member two is not in contact with the ground. There's no reaction force from the ground. The only thing member two touches is member one. You with me on that? And then at the joint B, so a side view, um, we have member two. Uh, member three and member five. And member two is the lowest numbered member at that joint. So the pin is part of uh, the pin is part of member two. Okay. So this is two, three, and five. And um, there's also the force. Uh, 
you know, member two is also, if you think of that, this joint as a roller, you can also think of member two as being the one that the joint is a part of. Okay, so the force from the ground is gonna be applied to member two. Okay, but the force from the ground is not gonna be applied to three or five. Well, it's arbitrary which one, we could have numbered it so that what we call five here is number one, and then we would have, and then we would have said that the pin is on five, and that means that the roller is on five. So yeah, it's totally arbitrary. The answers will come out the same in the end, but we're just trying to be consistent about how we choose. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess maybe the the most, And then, and then it's just like, what's the pin connected to whatever it is? That's what gets the roller to the pin. Uh, joint C. Um, so we have member one. Member three. and member four, and the pin is part of member one. So um, this is one, three, four. And then at D, we have four and five, and the pin is part of member four. Any questions about what those joints look like? Okay, so now we're gonna use this information to draw the free body diagrams of the body. So first, a free body diagram of member one. Okay, so down at A, uh, one is touching the ground, and one is touching two. At the joint C, the other end of member one, um, one is touching three and one is touching four. So F13, F14. You could also write that as plus, you know, we're just adding those two together to get the force on, uh, on this member. Any questions about that? Then a free body diagram of member two. Two is the horizontal one. And it's going between joints A and B. Okay, so at joint A, what's member two touching? Just one. Yep. Uh, and that's. So that's F21, and that's, we'll write that as negative F12. And then at the joint B, what's it touching? 3, 5, and the ground, yep. So F23, F25, and there's a force like this from the roller. Well, from the ground to the roller, you know, we're we're treating that roller like it's part of member two.
and then free body diagram of member three. That's the vertical one. It goes between B and C. Okay, so down at the bottom, at B, what's member three touching? Not five. That's sort of the key thing, okay? Uh, it's only touching that pin. And so, um, so here we have the force on three by two. And we've already used two, three, so I'm going to replace that as negative is F, two, three, and then negative. And then up at the joint C, what's member three touching? Just one. So F, three, one, and we've already used one, three, so I'll replace that. And then for member four, uh, that's the hor uh, horizontal one at the top. That's going between joints C and D. So what's four at the joint C, what's four touching? Just one. So that's F41, and that's negative F14. And then at joint D, what's four touching? Five, yep. Four, five. And then the last one is member five. Member five goes from uh, B to D. So at B, what's five touching? Just two. So F on five by two is equal to negative F on two by five. And up at D, what's five touching? Only four. So that's F five four, and that's equal to negative F four five. And then, don't forget this. Uh, is that the direction I drew it? No, down. Okay. Um, once you get through the step of, you know, if you get the free body diagrams right, everything else is stuff that you've done a lot of times before, just doing the trigonometry and you know, doing going through the calculations. This is the part where it's sort of easy to mess stuff up, uh, especially in the cases where you have more than two members connecting at individual joints. Any questions about that? Okay, let's stop there. I'll give you a couple of these to work on over the weekend. Um, and let me know if you have questions.